Good morning. You're going to uh, have the pleasure of helping me through my jet lag this morning. Okay. Two days here. Uh, my wife and I, of course, went to Stoke-on-Trent for the important Christmas shopping. It is July, after all. Uh, Stoke-on-Trent. You know what they're famous for, right? Pottery. Right. Okay. You guys are all from England, of course. I probably know more about England than you, right? <laughs> Having been here as a visitor. I'll tell you, if you want to know some good places to go, let me know. I'll tell you all about it. Um, <clears throat> now, for you guys in the room, you take your wife there as a special treat, you know, to prove that you're a really good husband. You go pottery shopping for two days. But anyway, we're going to talk about uh, beyond the aptitude test. I'll tell you more about the aptitude test. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about uh, refactoring three critical skills. Uh, I've got a shameless plug here to start out with. Uh, which is my book on test-driven development for Embedded C. And I also do uh, some public training. We're scheduling some coming up in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, if you've got friends. And I also do these web-delivered ones. Is John Jagger in the room? Thanks to the power of Cyber Dojo, um, I could uh, do some training from Chicago to people wherever they might be. And I've done this a uh, number of times now. Thank you, John. Um, oh, this is way too long of a cartoon to read uh, from XKCD. But someone's complaining about the code, about the code, complaining, complaining, complaining. And then down here at the bottom, the person who's coded is says, where does my pointer come from? There it is. Uh, whatever, it runs. What does it matter? Hmm. I know, there's a lot of people in the room that think, yeah, this is funny. Ha, huh? just runs. That's not good enough for code. Uh, what happens to code over time? So I'm going to look at this picture here, and I'll just reach up. Uh, in the beginning, there was no code, and it was good. <laughs> then, then something happened. What happened out here? That first transition to red. Now, I don't mean failing tests for you test-driven developers out there. What happened? Some important life event at your company, or, uh, oh, we got a customer. They sent us feedback. They asked for another feature. We hired some new people. We lost our architect. Whatever it might be, the code started getting bad. And then once it started, you didn't know what to do. You, you were institutionalized away from changing working code. No, you're not allowed to change working code. You can make a copy of it and paste it and tweak it into another program, but you cannot change working code. And now you're about to go out of business and you decide, what can we do next? Start to get things better. Well, there's some advice that people have given you about what to do with existing code, but what I'd like to do is talk to you about how do you prevent this in the first place. Uh, let's see now, quote that went by on Twitter not too long ago, if you think good architecture is expensive, try bad architecture. <laughs> it's even more expensive. I've been working on a little project for my brother. He had some co code developed for himself, and this is where the idea of the aptitude test came to me. Um, here's this Android app, it works. It works really nicely. Um, and I thought, and he asked me, could I make some changes to it? I'll tell you about those later. Um, but um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But what's valuable about software besides the valuable thing it does? We can change it, right? Well, we're supposed to be able to change it. Um, but let's look at the tail of three code bases. Now, let's see, I've got a remote here. Three code bases. The first code base is this custom Android app. And it does work. It passes what I call now the aptitude test, spelled A-P-P hyphen titude. If you can get the app to work, maybe you have a future as a programmer. Now, I'm not saying anything disparaging about getting the app to work. That's really hard to do. So if you can do that, you might have a future as a programmer. But there's more to it. Um, my brother's program initially acquired, he's not a technical person. Uh, but it, it acquired data through a Bluetooth connection. And he said, well, could you change it? We need Wi-Fi so we can get through some walls and get some greater distance. And, sounds, and I, I thought, well, that doesn't sound too hard. It already works for Bluetooth. And there's the demo mode. So I'm kind of envisioning this architecture where you could plug in demo mode or you could plug in Bluetooth. And it's like, I'll just make another plug-in for Wi-Fi. It should be pretty easy. Well, except I searched for, what did I search for? Demo mode uh, or Bluetooth. And of the almost 2,000 line main activity, okay, so 
as a C programmer, when I see something called main activity, I think of main in C. Um, now, if, if I think of 1,934 lines of in a main, I think there's a problem here. And so if there's 1,934 lines in a thing called a main activity, I think there's probably a problem there. And 30 references to a thing called Bluetooth and 18 references to a thing called demo mode. Hmm, Fred, maybe this isn't going to work as easily as I thought, but it does work. Will anyone understand it? I wonder if the guy who wrote it will understand it <laughs> next month, next week, tomorrow. Um, now, just as an illustration of what was happening to me as I went through this code, uh, the question, how many details can you keep track of at once? So let's go find out. Maybe demo mode. Bluetooth is going to be kind of like demo mode. Uh, so here's a mention of demo mode. Well, here's the next mention of demo mode. Oh, all in conditional logic. Oops, what happened? Well, I get to join the guest network. Okay. Now where did my mouse go? Okay. There it is. Okay. Let's turn off Wi-Fi. Oh, okay. I'm expecting that to happen again, so I'm going to go turn off my Wi-Fi. All right, so back to how many details can you keep in your head? So I'm going through this code base and looking at demo mode and understanding the code and trying to figure out what's going on. And something happens as you're going through and you have a few of the details in your mind and you get a few more, and then they start to just, you don't get to control which ones go away either. <laughs> the really important ones might go away, and maybe some, some re ridiculous ones might stay in your brain. It's not really our choice, and eventually you're ending up with, well, it's, whew. Okay, so I spent about a week of not stress-free work refactoring and adding in Wi-Fi. Now, there was no way to test this thing because it could only run in an Android, so I had to sweep the code. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Then there's another code base I thought I'd talk about. Um, my brother's having something else built for his company. It's a little embedded C program, and I said, oh, can I take a look at that code? As, you know, it was written by a 17-year veteran, and so I look at this code base, and here's one of the files. And now this is kind of hard to understand what it is. I cut out all the code. I just left the names of the functions there. And I might have improved a couple of them so that we knew what they were saying, adding the vowels back in because somehow C programmers have a uh, dislike for vowels. I'm not quite sure where that comes from. But uh, here are, in red, are some of the functions about business logic, about what this device's main function is. And then here in green are some persistence functions. This is all one file, by the way. Okay, so C doesn't... Uh, enforce any sort of structure on your code. You can do whatever you want. So this person kind of just randomly uh, put things in various places. And then uh, the stuff in blue is low-level stuff about how to interact with the hardware. Hmm. Uh, but it works. It works. And my brother's company is about to make a bunch of money off of it, uh, which is a good thing. Um, there's no separation of concerns, no abstraction, no cohesion, no application of dry. I found the same code in several places. And there were no tests. Hmm. And was this uh, the work of a 17-year veteran or a expert beginner? Well, we'll hear more about expert beginners maybe tomorrow. Uh, let's see. So what do uh, these apps have in common? Well, they work. The programmer passed the aptitude test. How do we, now, know, they how do we know they work? Well. I had to play with them a lot to see if they worked. How would we know that they work after I made one change? We wouldn't know that anymore. <laughs> that was a, that's a problem. Here's my uh, more questions, John. <laughs> so uh, in the future, they're probably going to have some tests around them. So anyway, let's see. Now, even though all these are doing is passing the aptitude test, uh, no offense meant. If you didn't see anything that there, there that you didn't like, that you didn't think was perfectly good software engineering, no offense, man, it's hard to get an app to work, especially these things. They're quite complicated. Software has two values. Here's the design pattern being used by both of those uh, bits of code. That's a, a shotgun blast to the knee. 
Okay, now I don't know, do they allow shotguns in UK? I don't know. Okay, now let's look at the story of the third code base. And uh, a few years ago, so fitness, some of you might have heard of fitness. Uncle Bob's code, some of you using it? Anybody using it? Now everybody's using Cucumber, right? Yeah, okay. But anyway, so fitness. Um, I was working with Sabre, and we were doing some testing. We are using fitness to do the testing, and I needed a new feature. And so I emailed Bob, and I said, Bob, there's this great feature that you should have in fitness. And Bob said, well, I can't put it in tonight. Well, why don't you put it in? It's like, well, I've never seen the code base. And he said, well, go look at, download like this, run the test like this, go look at these tests over here, because that's what you're looking for. Open up this file. You'll find something similar. So with five minutes of advice, I got downloaded my 50,000 line uh, source file, uh, 4,400 lines of, 44,000, 50,000 lines of source, 44,000 lines of uh, test code, 2,800 unit tests, 331 acceptance tests, and I ran the tests, and I started poking around, and I added the new tests that I wanted. The new test was a variant of a previous test, as many tests are, <clears throat> and it failed. And then I started going down into the code to find where to change it. I found, oh, this is the place to change it. I broke about 20 tests. I'll back that change out. Oh, this is the place to change it. Broke five things. Then I finally found the right place to make the change. Didn't break anything else. And the next day, we got to use my new feature. Hmm. Now, this wasn't because I was anything special, okay? But it was because this code was built to be changed. One stress-free evening after a long day of consulting, I was able to do that rather than the one week I spent with the Android app trying to turn it into something where I'd feel safe enough to change it. So why was my experience so different with fitness? Well, we had Uncle Bob. I'm presuming some of you people know Uncle Bob or know of him. Right, okay, so he's telling us, uh, giving it, showing us by example. Now, let's see, do you know any of these guys? This is Sherman uh, and his, well, Professor Peabody and his boy Sherman. Uh, when you're a kid in the 60s growing up in the United States, uh, you learned history from these guys. And we'd come to the, you'd use the Wayback Machine there to go back in history. Uh, but uh, something I remember Martin Fowler, say, Fowler saying long ago, which actually I've discovered that he never said, um, is uh, any fool can write code the compiler understands, but it takes real skill to write code other programmers understand. Now those words, real skill, those kind of stuck with me. And in the early 2000s, I was thinking, you know, what are those skills? And as it turns out, he didn't say this at all. Uh, he said something similar. Any fool can write code that a computer can understand. Good programmers write code that humans can understand. Hmm. And I was with Martin the other day for lunch. I tried to get him to say the other thing so I could just count it as a quote, but <laughs> he wouldn't play the game with me. Um, so uh, not just any fool, Martin. Uh, you have to be able to pass the aptitude test. Um, Donald Knuth. We should change our attitude to program, towards programming. We're not writing code to make the computer do something. We're writing code to make sure other programmers know what we want the computer to do. Because right? any fool can write code. The, so, and I'm going to go back and misquote Martin again. It takes real skill. Now, what are these skills? So, some of you will know what these skills are. What does that skill represent? No, it's not a golf club. Someone wrapped around a, golf, around a tree. A nose, thank you. And my art is really wonderful, isn't it? Um, you need to develop a good nose for code. Now, that doesn't mean you can just say, this code stinks. We all know how to say that. Okay. You need to have a better vocabulary about what does it mean for the code to stink. And so uh, Fowler describes a lot of uh, code smells, and other people have described code smells. I added some of the ones that I see in C programs to my book. Uh, but, you, you know, finding what stinks isn't good enough. Um, you also have to have an idea of what would be better. How could we improve it? And um, it was interesting to me in one of the first teams that I ever coached in extreme programming. That's how I learned extreme programming was by coaching them. Uh, after a few visits, 
they would, and every visit kind of went like this. We would get something to work, we'd test drive it, we'd do a lot of pair programming. Then I'd be gone for a week or two, and then they would get some more stuff to work. They'd show me their work, and I'd come back and I'd say, oh, you know, great, these tests all passed. Let's move this code over here, let's move this code over there, and let's rearrange things so that it all works. And after a few cycles of that, very excited, at first that they were kind of bummed out that I was showing them better structure, but then after a few cycles, they started coming to me and say, that day I would come back, we got everything to work, and here's the code you're not going to like. They had developed a nose for bad code. They didn't know what to do about it yet, though. They weren't sure what would be better. And then the real revolutionary thing about uh, refactoring is this moving in small steps, is uh, being able to transform what you've done into small steps. Now, being able to say this stairway stinks is not very handy. Now, I was kind of surprised to find this stairway under the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, filled with garbage. No one's going to care if you had some more wine bottles or uh, coffee cups down there. I should be able to look at some code and say why it stinks, right? So uh, that beautiful backyard you saw a little while ago at the flowers, uh, that's my former home that backed up to a forest preserve. And in the, in the fall, when the weather starts to turn cold, guess what tries to get into my house? Say again? Fleas? Leaves. No, the leaves, not the leaves, the mice. There's lots of mice living in that field, and I've worked hard to protect my house from that. But what happens uh, when a mouse does manage to get through my first layer of defenses, it gets caught in the second layer. It is a capital crime to enter my house as a mouse, and he finds a mouse trap. And the mouse then will do what dead mice do. They start to smell, although I have bad allergies, so I don't smell a thing. And my wife will say, James, you have a mouse in the basement. So she's got a really well-tuned nose for that. Okay. Now, it's been a few years since we've had any more. I've plugged all the holes. But So we need a vocabulary around this. And there's a lot of uh, a vocabulary that uh, Martin Fowler's described and that uh, I've described a few more. Now, where does all this bad code come from? It's somebody else's fault. And so uh, have you ever looked at your code a few weeks after you wrote it and not been so happy? All right. So if everybody would, you programmers, just stand up for a second. I'm going to help you. Okay. Um, you have to repeat after me. I am a programmer, and I write code that uh, stinks. I am a programmer. And I write code that uh, stinks. OK, see, that wasn't so hard. Um, OK. <laughs> now, the first, uh, on the road to recovery, you have to be able to admit what the problem is. OK? And so if you can't admit the problem, right, you're not going to be that interested in trying to learn a solution to it. So uh, now the other, uh, the amazing thing about these small steps, which, you know, why don't we just change the code, do a redesign? No, that's too dangerous. I've really come to appreciate this. It only took me like 19 years to really appreciate working in small steps. So when I first saw Kent Beck demonstrate extreme programming in 1999, I had 20 years of experience, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is an important thing. Uh, unlike most people that see it think, oh my gosh, it's the most stupid thing ever. Um, I thought it might help, especially people doing embedded systems. And I know there's some embedded systems people in the room. There's Brian. Are there other people that work in embedded systems? All right. Okay, so uh, one of the things that occurred to me when I saw that is like, I spent 20 years not being able to run my code until late in the project when the hardware was ready. So unlike many of you people not working in embedded systems, you have the luxury of somewhere to run your code. We didn't have anywhere to run it. And you could actually run it in a test harness. And then when you decided to change your code, you could change it because you've got these tests there. Um, you don't have to worry about the humpy, Humpty Dumpty syndrome, of breaking the code and having it fall apart. Um, keeping your code working. Uh, it's easier to keep your code running than to fix it after you break it. So over the last couple of years, uh, John Jagger helped me get interested in uh, Ruby on Rails, and I decided to build my website in Ruby on Rails, not knowing anything about it except having a couple of tours of Cyber Dojo from John Jagger. Um, and what I would do when I'm working on Ruby on Rails is follow the procedure and then push the button to try to get to my new web page and get a huge stack trace. Hmm, that didn't work so well. And then I'd go look through the six steps I took and try to find what went wrong. 
and make a change. Oh, there's a mistake. Oh, I still get the stack trace. Here's a mistake. And then I eventually came up with the magic that made it work. Um, now I work much more carefully. Why are, what are those six steps? How would I know if I got the first step right? Does the error message change if I get the first step right? right? So I can keep the code working. It's easier to, to keep a system running than to fix it after you break it. And that's where this test-driven thing, which most of you are aware of, is about, is about, well, getting your code to work in the first place. Uh, and I would say, that people often say there's a, the future, pay, the payback for TD is only in the future. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's right now. Because the, if you compare TDD to the time you would spend doing some other form of testing, uh, by the time you're done test driving something, usually I would be done before the person who is using what I call debug later programming to get that same thing tested. So write a test, watch it not build. But then the other advantage is that I have these test cases that help me. And how do they help me? They help me keep the code badness low for a long, useful life. If I can keep the code badness low. I've got to know what to do, though. And my goal of refactoring is clean code that works. But, you know, what is clean code? How would we know? Uh, well, a stolen page from a stolen comic uh, from a clean code. You've probably seen this comic before. Good code's on the left. Only, I'll have to tell you what the acronyms mean in a second. Um, I can stay within the code of conduct for the, for the uh, conference as well. Uh, what's that for? All right, so you've got, a, you've got a code review where there's only a couple of what's that for's, and then you've got another code review where there's some other things besides what that for being said. Um, now, there's a lot to design. And what really, you know, so working with a, a lot of people in embedded systems, pretty much everybody works solo. So they don't get this advantage of seeing other people's work and learning from them. <clears throat> so they do things their own way, and every bit of code looks very uh, different than every other bit. Um, but if you see other people's code and maybe get it to the place where other people can understand it, that would be a wonderful thing. This is a difficult skill. This is a lifelong learning for sure. Uh, what are the different things that we have to learn? And let's see, how are we doing for time? I've got about 20 minutes left. Um, envisioning, you know, so how do we know what is better? So there's a lot of things you can go learn about. The solid design principles, uh, dry hexagonal architectures, separation of concerns. Um, a lot of good ideas out there, a lot of people that have expressed ideas on, on how to improve this. Uh, the rules of simple design are a nice place to start. Uh, code's got to work. It's gotta, how do we know it works, John? Passes its tests, right? So uh, it's stated as passes, all, passes its tests as if the tests were the important part. But actually the important part of this first rule is if your code doesn't work, it doesn't matter what its structure is. So passing the aptitude test is essential for your customer because your customer is paying you for code that works. Now, steps two and three, or the next two steps, if your code works, then we should be concerned with no duplication. Now, I think these steps two and three are out of order, but these aren't my steps. These are Kent Beck's steps. Um, so I'm putting them in Kent's order, no duplication, and expresses intent. Um, and then finally, fewest classes and methods. We'll come, maybe come to that later, but that, that pretty much means no extra stuff. You know, so next week we're adding this other feature. Oh, let's drop some little clues about where we think that next feature is gonna go into the code base and, and add some things there. But let's talk about this no duplication that expresses intent. Um, well, J.B. Rainsberger says the same thing. Remove duplication and fix the bad names. I think things have to be in the right place as well. Um, I would say that we're going to look at an example where we're removing duplication, but the intent gets completely lost. So just removing duplication, if I'm thinking code duplication, that's the wrong thing to, th thing to think. <clears throat> now, for some reason, I've got this slide here with a broom on it. Um, what did I do with my Android application? So I'm kind of stuck with the legacy code problem with this brand new code my brother had built. Um, what I had to do to keep it working and get things out of the main activity was to sweep everything to do with demo mode, basically one small change and then run the application manually at a time. Very tedious, 
careful thing. And if it didn't work right, I'd back the change out and try again, and then sweep the Bluetooth over into an area, and then get a module that's plug replaceable that, that does Wi-Fi. Okay, very tedious kind of work. Um, I ended up in a better place, though. My main activity is now not as big as it was. Uh, and there's only eight references to uh, Wi-Fi and nine references to demo mode. I think I'm going in the right direction. Um, starting to improve. I think those slides are out of order, but you'll give me a little break there, won't you? Okay, I've got jet lag, so I didn't notice that. Um, now back to dry. <laughs> is this about code duplication? Any of you read The Pragmatic Programmer? What did they say about this? It's not code duplication. It's idea duplication that's a problem. So here's a couple of tests. Now someone taking my TDD for Embedded C training class will probably write these tests. Why do they write these tests? Because I show them, this is the test you should write. I lead them down this path to write this test, which is, there's two tests that look exactly the same. Six lines of code. What's a long method at your, com at your company? Uh, is six lines long? Hmm. Well, the number of lines is kind of not relevant. It's how quickly you can fit it into your head and how quickly you can see differences between things and how quickly you can get the idea of what's going on. Uh, there's a lot of duplication between these. And if I followed rule number two of dry, I might end up with this. What the heck do I call this function? Passing it three every day, 1200, Sunday, 1199, no light AD, no light state. Well, there is no duplication here anymore. But I have no idea what this code is doing. And I went from some tests that uh, add something to a schedule, set up the fake time, simulate a callback, check the results. I have four phase test pattern, given when then, however you'd like to call that. I've lost that view, but I don't have any duplication. But now my code doesn't speak to me. That's a problem. So what should we be really striving for? Uh, I'd like the code to tell me what it's doing. Well, here's, in this case, a test. Uh, I, I would look for it to, to be structured in a, a form of given when then, or uh, set up, do something, check, clean up, or arrange, act, assert, whatever your favorite way of describing that is. It should, those steps should be available. And I should be able to look at this and know what the code is trying to do. Um, so let me read this now. So we scheduled something, and then we transitioned the clock to Sunday, and then lights would not be changed. So if I had a, a light scheduled, light number three, for every day at the 1200th minute of the day, and the clock transitioned to Sunday at 1199, then the lights would be unchanged. So this, this kind of tells its story. Now, usually the way people starting to refactor will do this refactoring is they might break it into these steps. But what they don't do often is name these, things, name these extracted pieces of code in a way that helps the reader of the next level up. What they do is they tell the story of what's going on inside the code. Set time and wake up. I get 75% of the people that will actually structure their test this way end up with a name like set time and wake up. Well, it is true that this function is setting the time and waking up. It's just not that interesting from the reader of this test perspective. So there's this intentional naming that's really important for the reader, right? So that we're providing some abstraction to them so that they know, oh, here's an event happening to this thing. The clock, the time is changing. What does that look like? We could go look and see how it's done. But if I'm not that interested, I don't need to. I know what the intention of that area of the code is. Clock changes too. OK, let's see. <clears throat> so uh, you know, when you start out a talk and you name it with the number three in it, sometimes that's limiting. Because well, as you start collecting your ideas, uh, have you ever said, oh, there's one thing I wanted to mention. Oh, actually, there's two. And then when you say there's two, then you think of the third. Maybe there's a fourth thing. Key to uh, a key skill to being able to refactor. And that might be test-driven development as a fourth skill. Um, how does test-driven development help me refactor my code? Well, one thing it might do is as I'm looking at the code and it's, I can see the place I should change, 
But that place is going to resist testing. Let's say there's an error that's supposed to come back when you call a function. And to get that error to happen is kind of difficult. Right? So this code is starting to resist testing because it's like you're going to be tempted to say, well, we just won't test that because that's not going to happen very often. And I really don't want that code to execute for the first time when that error condition happens in the field, um, even if it's very rare. I don't want to have that code tested live by the customer. I'd rather test it. So test-driven development is going to help us see some of these things because if I can't devise a test for the code, it's telling me something. So it's lack of visibility. So maybe a fourth A fourth skill would be there as well, to keep the code badness low for a long time. Uh, getting you past passing the aptitude test. And I guess this isn't a 45 minute talk right now, except with questions, it might be. Any questions? Comments? For my learned friends. Yes? Um, two or three more. They, is that what they think they just, or do they think they can remember a lot more? The question was, what do you do about the person? Now, by the way, I just disclaim, what do you do about the person who's on the team that claims that they can remember two or three more details and so they don't need the support ne mechanism that maybe I need? Or, okay. Um, now, first off, let me just make a disclaimer. I'm an engineer. Okay, when I saw extreme programming, I thought, this is going to be a better way to engineer. All this people stuff is the part where I'm uncomfortable. Okay, I'm glad there's people paying attention to this. Um, but, you know, what could you do? Uh, write your tests anyway. Uh, are you in a code ownership area where you guys are sharing or owning your own code, or do you have to share? Um, how, where are you? So this makes me want to ask a bunch of other questions. Where, where is your team in this? How many people are doing are trying to uh, do test room development? If you feel like answering yeah, any of these. Something I've observed over the years that some people just really like the simplicity, but yeah. often I run into people who are, I guess they've kind of made a living out of understanding these big messy code bases. Yeah. To be able to just, just keep a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And then they become resistant to things that they change that. Yeah. Because the people, you know. Send them to my class would be the first thing to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because uh, one of the things that we do in my class is after they've experienced test-driven development uh, and they've got a new preconceived notion and the old preconceived notions, we try to explore those. Because for each individual, there's a different set of preconceived notions as to what's going on and why something is valuable or not. Um, but uh, I think if you're suggesting to someone to adopt this way of working because you think it's a good way of working and it's cool, uh, that's not going to appear... That's not going to appeal so much to people um, as, well, here's some problems we're trying to solve. And the problem that, uh, that I use as a first hook is defect prevention. So what if we could prevent defects? What if we could somehow prevent defects and not have to spend as much time debugging? Right? So uh, I use that as like the initial hook for TDD. And you can kind of paint a pretty good logic chain that shows how that might happen. And you have to kind of experience it. Um, so maybe, uh, I know in the early days of teaching people extreme programming and test-first programming, we thought, if you show them, they will come. And the rude awakening was, no, people don't actually want to just adopt a different way of working. Uh, the only reason to change to a different way of working is if it's solving some problem. And so what I want to do is make sure that we can appeal to what problems are trying, we're trying to solve. Okay. Right. Yes? Yeah, so, I, so let me just restate that. Okay, so uh, I was talking about naming things from the reader of the called. Okay, so when we're calling the function, it should be named from that calling context. Okay? How do you pull yourself out of that? Like, how do you uh, stop thinking about what the code is doing and start thinking about how? Hmm. You know, the, uh, Arlo Belchi 
wrote kind of an interesting thing about the, the different stages of a name. Um, and uh, the first thing we would do is just name it something. He, what he does is he names it something absurd at first. And then you know that's absurd, and you know you're not going to leave it. You know, the function's called um, coffee cup, right? And you're passing it water. I don't know. You know, so um, that should throw an exception. Uh, but anyway, uh, so Arlo talks about these different stages of the coffee, of the, the names. And, you know, so one would be explaining what it's doing, okay? But that's not, but that isn't as good as abstracting it. And so um, I think that the, the test is, for me, would be if I read the name and then I know the intention of what's supposed to be happening rather than how is it being done. Um, that's why that third skill is harder to learn. <laughs> that's why it's going to be a while before you're done. Okay, I'm not done yet. Got more to do. Yes. Oh, I, I just got a, a question about that the other day from a, one of my new clients. It says, like, I'm about to institute metrics so we can find out if your training was successful. Uh, that's not what he said, but I'm reading between the lines. Um, and what code coverage should we require of our engineers? Okay. And I wrote him a long email and sent him to a blog post I wrote, which said um, code coverage is a flawed metric. Um, code co coverage of zero tells you? It's actually valuable at this level. What does code coverage of zero tell you? You, gotta, you don't have any tests. You've got a lot of work to do. What does code coverage of 100% tell you? Not, nothing meaningful, OK, except your code is executing. Oh, in, uh, in the embedded world, it's really popular for people to buy an expensive tool called, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, vector or something, that will generate the code, generate tests for you. Okay, and there's these guys in the medical industry that are saying, oh yeah, we use this vector thing to generate our unit tests, we don't have to write them. It's like, hmm, okay, so it's not checking anything. Nope, it's not checking anything, but all the code does execute. And why did you start to use this tool? Well, we're gonna get a bonus if we got 100% code coverage and now we have 100% code coverage. Um, so anyway, I'm not talking bad about 100% code coverage. If you test drive something, the areas that you test drive will have 100% code coverage for the right reason, because you and if you're paying attention to running through all the paths, okay? Uh, so why are you talking bad about code coverage? Um, code, code coverage is a tool. It doesn't tell you if you checked anything, all right? So if you go into your code and delete all the checks, you will still have your code coverage, right? So, hmm, that's not so, that's not so valuable. You get a lot of robot do that, and there's companies that build those robots. So if you're on the golf course and you found out that the new Goal for the year is 100% code coverage. Go buy the tool. It's only 50,000 pounds, probably. Um, and then you guys get your bonuses. Now, let's do the right thing. Let's start to write test. So um, certain areas of your code where you test drive, I would expect 100% code coverage for the areas that you test drive. And the areas that you uh, don't test drive, I wouldn't expect that. So if, can I make my UIs really skinny and not have any unit tests for them? Can I make my models rich and test all the paths, those should be 100%. Uh, code coverage is kind of a handy tool to see how you're doing at uh, test-driven development while you're learning. Did we forget anything? And I know one of the early uh, encounters with test-driven development, we had a couple of the junior people pairing for a couple of days, and then we ran the code coverage afterwards, and they missed a whole bunch of code. And so we were able to use that as a, a learning mechanism. So I'd probably find it helpful for that. Yes? Yeah. <clears throat> so the question is, uh, is it fair to um, take on the refactoring of a given area of code uh, proactively or reactively to the new feature that touches yeah, react okay yeah I, I kind of think of it as not really as uh, I, I think of it as opportunity and the cost of doing business so we saw that picture all right so well the cost of doing business is going up like crazy 
So how do we start getting it to go down? Uh, I, would, I would like to see at least, as a minimum standard would be, we're going to touch this module for the first time in a while. It does have this amount of debt. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to, uh, the answer that I would like to get would be we're going to take this thing, pull it into a test harness, and write some test for the area of it that we're going to change, and that's the cost of doing business, and do some refactoring to start to improve it. That's the cost of doing business. I can imagine in a pragmatic world that you might say, well, this is a thing that we haven't changed it in a long time, and we don't envision changing it again, and the way that we're going to manually test it, uh, we can be confident in, and maybe in this case we're going to choose not to. To not have the discussion and to leave it up to an individual I think is the wrong thing to do. Um, what I would encourage would be to have this be, you know, the exception. Why aren't you going to have a test for it? Okay. Um, you know, I read articles about test coverage, and I saw one not long ago about um, someone that had the 100% coverage uh, thing beat into their brain so that they were kind of doing inappropriate stuff to the code to get that. I don't remember the article, so I can't point you at it, but... Um, What's this saying, this shuha re thing? It used to be important. Uh, anybody know this term? So shu would be uh, the first stage of martial arts or whatever where you just do what your sensei says. And so usually, uh, you know, in a, a training class like I give, they're in the shu stage the whole time. Now, usually by the end of a training class, they're starting to know why they're doing it. And then they're willing to keep doing it because now they've kind of internalized, now they've learned why. And then... Uh, when you get to the shu, uh, oh, ha is the middle, and then re is the advanced, then you like kind of discover you know, what it's really good for and when you can you know, use one motion versus the other. Um, any other questions? Yes? I'm going to talk about them a little bit tomorrow. <laughs> um, sometimes we don't know what we don't know. I mean, we don't know what we don't know. And sometimes we're, you know, you can be unaware of what known unknowns and the known, un the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, right? So sometimes we just don't know. Um, there's a guy that, so I'm not going to answer your question right now, except uh, there's a guy that was interacting with me on my blog, a whole bunch of conversations, and he was uh, telling me how Agile is like such a horrible thing, and it only ever fails, and it's only ever been used on little tiny stuff, and so we had this conversation. At first, he was kind of rude, and then I got him to stop using the F word and that sort of thing in the, on my blog, okay, and uh, eventually, he said, I know what you mean, and I had replied to him. I said, well, actually, you've been working really hard to not know what I mean. Okay, you've, you've tried really hard to not try and understand what I'm saying. And then, then he went away for a couple months, which is good. I also, at that moment, went to Twitter and, and tweeted something. I said, uh, I remember when I was a young guy, I used to know everything. I've learned a lot since then. So, anything else? I think we're officially out of time. Thanks for the questions. Okay. Cheers.